recording is on. <laughs> so go, you can go ahead and call the meeting to order, Ann. Okay, so uh, please bear with me. This is my first time, okay? <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. And I guess our first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from January 20th, 2020. What do I say now? Um, just see if anyone, uh, we'll see if anyone has any um, additions or corrections to the minutes. Okay, any additions or corrections to the minutes? And if not, can I have a, uh, what's the term, Mieko? Help me out here. <laughs> a motion, we'll have a motion to approve. A motion to approve. I motion to approve. Karen Moulton, <laughs> motions to approve. Thank you, Karen. Lori seconds. And Lori seconds. <laughs> Beautiful. See how well that went. Nice. That is so smooth. Okay, good. Now. <laughs> um, before we move on, I, I'm going to stand in as secretary today. Um, we do not have a, obviously do not have a physical sign in sheet for everyone to record their name in libraries on. Um, so if we can just take a minute, if everyone could type in their name and library code into the chat box, that's going to stand in as our way to take roll. Thank you <laughs> for everyone who's already here. <laughs> And we'll, we'll pause um, kind of in the middle of the meeting to catch any latecomers. Um. So do the ones that show up as privately show up on your list, Mieko? They do not, and they will not be recorded. Any private chats will not be recorded. Uh, oh, I mean, people are just posted. signing in. There's a few that mm -hmm. are signing in, and it says, I'll, I'll out Tori at Lake Forest. She she did it um, privately, but she's signing in, so I'm assuming yeah. she wants to be counted. Well, um, if you could just like copy and paste the chat before we close the meeting out, and and then we'll grab those sure. private chats. That would be. I think that would work. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Let's so the, the next thing are addi additions to the agenda. Do we? Um, CCS does have one small addition. Um, if we could uh, just tack a short discussion on um, to the governing board decision on interest CCS loan. Uh, we just want to have a get some input on how libraries are quarantining items at the moment. So um, hopefully that should just take a couple minutes. So we'll do that at the end of new business. Um, if we could do that with the governing board decision on interest CCS loan, so right at the oh okay at the top. beginning of that okay yeah figure it fits in okay and now the officer reports I have nothing except hello everyone hope you're all doing well <laughs> and thank you for being so patient with me so. and we don't have a vice chair or a secretary I don't think not at so this time anyone Hopefully would like to. Help hopefully out. later. Hopefully later in the meeting we will. <laughs> okay, great. Um, now CCS staff reports. Hello. Yes. Hello? I am going to oh, take hi. the lead I'm on this sorry. one. I'm on a chat um, meeting with the. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute. Um, if you guys are talking, go ahead and mute yourself. And if you have questions, feel free to unmute. Um, I have a little bit, I have a little PowerPoint. So Mieko is going to go ahead and share her screen with the group. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Struggling with this. That's okay. At my last Zoom meeting, I thought I was sharing my PowerPoint <clears throat> with everyone. And I wasn't. I was just talking to blank space. So we're doing better already today than I was a couple days ago. All right, Mieko, I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to request remote control from you so I can move forward through the slides. So the first update, technical difficulties here, hold on guys. Here we go. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is 
Um, our upcoming Polaris upgrade to Polaris 6.5. Um, so we have tentatively scheduled an upgrade to Polaris 6.5 for the evening of Tuesday, August 4th at 9.30 p.m. We're still waiting for confirmation from Innovative on the date and then the start time, but we should have that by next week. So we'll be able to confirm that in next week's CCS News. Whoop, I'm going to go back. I may have actually done that. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Oh my goodness. We're just, <clears throat> apparently this PowerPoint wants me to just jump right ahead to talk about Peloton and Grace Lake, but that will come in time. Um, so going back to the upgrade to Polaris 6.5, again, we've tentatively scheduled this for the first week of August, Tuesday, August 4th, after libraries close at 930 um, with the upgrade to Polaris 6.5, we're going to gain a couple of really key features that I think this group will be excited about. Um, the first one is the patron preferred name field. So in addition to having a field for a patron's legal name, this upgrade will give us a second field for a patron's preferred name so that you can keep track of both in the, in the patron's account and it'll be easily accessible to staff from the patron registration screen registration screen. So I'm really excited about that. I know a couple of you out there will be excited as well. Um, another key feature of this upgrade will be the ability to cancel in transit or shipped holds. So right now you're not able to cancel holds that are in transit, but with this upgrade we'll be able to do that. Uh, so you don't have to put notes in the holds or make notes to yourself, put sticky notes to cancel holds that arrive at the library. Um, so that'll be a really key feature. A couple other features that might be of interest are the ability to suspend and reactivate holds in bulk. So currently right now, you have to suspend a patron's hold one at a time, uh, and then again, reactivate them one at a time. So this upgrade will give us the ability to do, to suspend all of a patron's holds in one fell swoop. Uh, another feature is the ability to manually bill a patron, so, and then deliver a notice to the patron um, based on that manual bill. So that will be another really helpful feature for circulation staff as well. Uh, just a quick question about the canceling um, in transit holds. Do you happen to know what it's going to look like when the hold actually comes in? Like to the library that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when we scan it, will it say it was canceled and we just send it back? I don't believe, and Mieko, I might defer to you on this in case you've come across this in training during your um, testing. I believe when you cancel the hold, if that item then arrives at your library, um, it will essentially just then be triggered to be sent back in transit to the owning library or to a different library to trap a hold for another patron. Okay. I don't believe you'll see a message indicating the right, hold that was, was originally sent for was canceled. You'll just be prompted to send it back, back. to okay. the next location. Thank mm -hmm. you. Deborah, can I ask you a question about manually billing a patron? So yes, is the I only difference, that. is it the only difference from, from, from what the current, you know, system allows currently is that it will notify the patron? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so currently, the only way for a bill to be sent to a patron, a bill notification, a bill notice, mm -hmm. is that the item is flipped to lost by the system. So the item is 45 days overdue, flipped to lost. So the ability to manually bill a patron will allow you to send a notification, a bill to a patron um, for other materials that, oh. for example, like a damaged item that a patron has returned and you need to bill them for. Okay. So this is a feature that I believe, and Mieko, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a bug preventing these bill notices from going out previously. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Uh, oh, so this just, should work. So this will be something we'll need to test and play around with. And um, this will go out automatically, like, you know, if they have email, an email notification will be sent to them. Yes, um, correct. Okay, mm -hmm. so we don't have to mm -hmm. so no, go in and print. Okay, correct. Unless their patron, uh, um, unless the preference is prints, or right. they have phone notification, at which point it would carry over into print as well. Okay, I do see a question in the chat from Roberta. 
um, who's asking, can a patron suspend all of their holds at one time or is that something that has to be done in LEAP? Patrons have always been able to suspend their holds in bulk from Power Pack, but staff haven't been able to do that in LEAP. So patrons can still suspend all of their holds at once in the catalog uh, and then unsuspend them all at once. But now staff working in, in LEAP will be able to do that as well. So for those patrons who have 50 holds that they need to suspend, this will be a really helpful tool and save staff a lot of time. All right. So as I mentioned, um, we've tentatively scheduled this for Tuesday, August 4th, after you close. The upgrade will take roughly two to three hours to complete. But again, this will be after hours um, from 9.30 to about midnight. During this time, production will be unavailable to patrons and staff. So production includes the staff clients, Leap, Power Pack, Simpler Reports, and then SIP and API connected tools. Um, all of your web-based interfaces, so Leap, Pack, and Simpler Reports will update to 6.5 without any staff intervention. In our previous upgrades, the remote desktop connection, so the staff client, that has updated automatically for staff, but in the event that that doesn't happen on your network, your IT staff may need to uninstall and reinstall the client connection. But again, we haven't had issues with that in the past. We've experienced that the remote connection to the client has always updated automatically to reflect the new 6.5 version, but just in case we do remember everyone that that might be work that has to be done. Any questions on what the upgrade itself entails? Okay. So we will confirm the upgrade date in next week's CCS News. So you can look for that information there. And then we'll also send out instructions to the relevant lists, um, particularly IT with directions on how to uninstall and reinstall the staff client, as well as update your, um, your offline client for 6.5, as well as the offline files that go along with that. Okay, any questions? I've lost the chat, so I can't see if any questions came in in the chat. So Mieko, anything? I, I, don't think, I don't think I'm able to, since you've got control of my screen, I don't think I'm able to navigate around. Oh, we are in a tough place here right now. <laughs> no, no, I, can see the chat. There, <laughs> I, I can see the chat, but there are no new questions. Okay. okay. It's sort of like I'm just speaking into the void right now. I can't see anyone's faces. I can only see my screen and my puppy who is on the other side of my screen. <laughs> so if anyone sees any comments, please feel free to read them out loud. <laughs> All right, then I will move on then to the next um, update from CCS, which is the Palatine and Grays Lake migration, which is right around the corner. It is less than two months away, which is crazy and shocking to me that we are already in July and we have an, a new a new migration come in right around the corner. So the timeline for this project has not changed. We are still anticipating that Grace Lake and Palatine will go live in CCS over Labor Day weekend. Oh, okay. um, so what does that mean for library or at the drive through So what does that mean for all of you? Um, um, what's Thank you. So Gray's Lake will move into Polaris offline on Thursday, September 3rd, and Palatine will move offline on Friday, September 4th. On Saturday, September 5th, all CCS libraries will move into Polaris offline mode. You'll remain offline through Labor Day, so through the holiday weekend, Monday, September 7th. And then we anticipate, provided the data load goes smoothly, that all CCS libraries, including Palatine and Gray's Lake, um, will be online at the start of day on Tuesday, September 8th. Does anyone have any questions on that schedule? questions? 
It's like, it feels both very far away because every month during COVID time is very long, uh, but it is also very soon. So again, all of our libraries will go offline for three days. Fortunately, this will happen over the holiday weekend. So all of you will be closed on Monday. So you should only have two days um, of offline due to this addition of the two libraries. But we expect that everything will go smoothly and we'll all be back online on that Tuesday, September 8th. So we'll continue to share information about the migration as we get a little bit closer. We'll host again a review of Polaris offline for libraries as we um, get into the later half of August. So we'll share, share that information once we've set a final date. But you guys are old pros at using offline now. Um, you're experts at adding new libraries. So I anticipate this will go as smoothly as Indian Trails and Morton Grove did. Okay. And that is the end of that update from my end. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. Um, the next thing on the agenda is old business, and apparently there is none. So we can move right to new business. Excellent. So this is back with me. Um, the next agenda item is a discussion of intra CCS lending and an update on the governing board decision that happened earlier this week. So governing board met this Wednesday to vote on whether and when CCS libraries would resume intra CCS lending. So as you know, over the past couple of months, um, libraries have only been filling holds with local materials. We have not initially due to a halt in rails delivery, but then as a CCSY decision, we have not resumed intra CCS sharing between our members. So governing board met this week to discuss how we should move forward as a group. So they did come to a decision um, and they voted that libraries can opt back into intra CCS lending on a monthly basis. So rather than move forward together, um, we will allow libraries to opt back into intra CCS lending when they're ready to do so. Um, libraries who would like to opt into intra CCS lending in July should email Rebecca by Tuesday, July 14th. And then on Tuesday, July 21st, CCS will update the holds routing sequence um, to put those libraries back in the resource sharing pool. Once we make those update to your pick list settings, the pick list will probably take like a day or two to adjust and to pull in and sort of cycle holds onto all of those library pick lists. Um, and then you should, if you opt to resume lending, you should start seeing holds to be sent in transit to other libraries pop back up on your pick list. We will opt libraries into intra CCS lending once per month. So the next opportunity after July 21st to opt back in will be August 18th. So Rebecca, based on your timeline here, if we opted in by Tuesday, July 14th, roughly we would see the changes take effect by July 23rd. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've noticed that when we've adjusted pick list settings, it just takes a little bit of time for the pick list itself to catch up to those settings. So we sure. think it would take about a day or two for the pick list to really adjust to the changes in the settings. Um, that being said, we governing board specifically requested based on feedback from staff. So thank you to everyone who talked to your director about this, that we make the changes not on a Monday because you are all very busy on Mondays. So we decided that Tuesday would be the best day to update these settings with the understanding that then by like Wednesday or Thursday, your pick list would settle into the new, the new changes. We didn't wanna make the changes on like a Thursday or Friday and have your pick list jump in numbers on Saturday or Sunday over the weekend. So we thought Tuesday would be a good day. And we'll see how that works this first opt-in and if we need to make any adjustments for the next month. So when we're talking about intra CCS lending and opting in, when you opt in to intra CCS lending, you're both then allowing your patrons 
to request material to be sent to you to fill their holes from the other libraries who have opted in, as well as then opting into pulling materials to send out. So you're opting into both receiving materials from other libraries as well as sending them out to other libraries. Um, one thing to just take note, and this was discussed with Governing Board, um, is that this means that some of CCS will begin resource sharing and some libraries won't. Um, and this is something that could be a potential point of confusion for patrons. So that might be something you'll see an increase in questions on once, once you resume or, or opt not to is who can they get materials from um, and who, who are they unable to receive items from. So CCS will publish a list of libraries that have opted back in. That way libraries know who is or isn't sending out their, their materials. Are there any questions? Okay, we thought that this was um, really the best, the best way to move forward for our libraries. Everyone seems to be in very different places for a number of different reasons, but this will allow, allow libraries who are ready um, to resume lending to, to do so, and those libraries who aren't, aren't ready or don't feel comfortable or safe doing so to, to wait until they are. So I think that this is the best, the best possible route forward for all of us. I see a question in the chat from Lori asking, do we know who's planning in, on opting in right now? I, I do not know um, who is or isn't opting in at, at this time. I don't know if we wanna do a quick, if anyone is planning to opt in, if you wanna pop your library name in the chat, that might be a good way to just do a quick straw poll. I see a, a question from, look at all you guys opting in. <laughs> Based on the conversation at governing board, it felt like we might have anywhere from like seven to 14 libraries opting back in, but definitely a handful that we're just not prepared to do so at this time. Excellent. I see a question from Lisa at McHenry um, asking, will the patron see items from libraries who have chosen not to opt in? Um, and the answer is, I suppose it depends on how your pack is set up. So some libraries have currently have their packs set up so that upon the initial search in the catalog, patrons are only searching local materials. Other libraries have their catalogs set up so that patrons see materials across all CCS libraries. Um, there won't necessarily be an in indication to the patron on which libraries they can receive materials from and which libraries they can't, unless your library chooses to make some pack language updates that would, that would include that information. Um, Kathleen has drafted some suggested language options for libraries to implement in their pack. Currently, most libraries have a note on their place hold button that indicates that holds can only be placed on local materials. So Kathleen has drafted some sample language changes um, for that button to indicate that some but not all materials um, are available to be placed on hold. So again, this is, it is going to be um, a bit of a messaging um, you'll need to find a, a strategy to approach how you'll share this information with your patrons, um, but we are more than happy to work with you to add updates to your language in your pack to make it easier and, and more clear for your patrons to understand. Deborah, um, mm -hmm. assuming we opt in, will those messages automatically be removed, the ones that are on there now? Mm -hmm. or, or do we need to put in a ticket to, to yes. have that? So um, Rebecca has already emailed Lib Admin. I'm, I think it just went to Lib Admin. It did not go to the circ list. Um, emailed them with the, the change we would make for you unless you would like alternate text. And if you would like alternate text to the default that we'll provide, um, if you would like different wording, you can open a ticket with CCS and we'll make that change. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll we'll make the the standard default change for everyone who opts in, unless you tell us otherwise, to put in alternative language, which we're more than happy to do. So please feel free to open a ticket for any custom changes. We want to make it easy for you though, if you were like, we're good with whatever CCS recommends, um, we wanted to at least give an option for libraries that are always happy to customize as well. Any other questions? I know this is a big change from the past few months. And one other thing that I just wanted to mention to this group um, is that in my previous update, I mentioned Peloton and Grace Lake will be going live. So we'll likely see some changes to your pick list in the week or two after they are live in CCS because we'll be introducing not only a large amount of new materials that will circulate among CCS libraries, and Palatine is planning to opt into interest CCS lending right away as soon as they're live. Um, but then we'll also be bringing in a number of Palatine and Grace like holds as well uh, for your materials. So we'll likely see some fluctuations in pick lists after the migration, but again, it's very difficult to predict what that could look like. So we'll have to wait and see, but I would plan that you might see some adjustments in your pick list size immediately following the go live. And what, the, what that adjustment will look like, we can't really anticipate. It's part of the excitement. <laughs> Any other questions about lending? So again, if you would like to resume interest CCS lending this month, um, email Rebecca by Tuesday, uh, end of day, and then we'll implement those changes on Tuesday, July 21st. If you're not ready, that's perfectly okay. Um, don't stress about that. We'll, we'll opt you back in when you are ready, and the next opportunity to do that will be August 18th. Okay. All right. I will turn it back over to you, Anne and Mieko. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ebra. The next item is the circulation man manual, re review and approve sections six through seven. Before we go on to that, sorry to cut you off, Anne. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. We were going to talk about the, the end the of the discussion. <laughs> so, yes. So, um, at Governing Board, they express an interest in establishing some best practices related to quarantining items. Um, and in order to do so, uh, they were hoping to have a discussion here at the CERC Technical Group meeting about libraries' current practices. Um, so we just kind of wanted to hear what you are currently doing uh, in terms of quarantining items. Um, some of the specific questions that came up were, when do you consider your three-day quarantine period to start? For example, do you consider the day the item is returned as day one, or do you consider the first full day the item in, is in your possession as day one? Um, if you're planning on quarantining incoming rails delivery for libraries who have opened their stacks, are you following, do you have any local practices for quarantining items that patrons may potentially have touched? Um, so we're, very much interested in hearing how your libraries are managing the whole quarantine process and uh, any local applications. I can, at Lake Villa, um, we are quarantining them for three days, but it's on the fourth day. So if something comes in Monday, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we check it in on Thursday, the fourth day since returns are coming in the entire day. Um, so we're doing it that way and it seems to be working okay. Um, we've also been quarantining the blue bins that have been coming in in the same manner, just to keep it consistent. We do the same at Prospect Heights. So we're still, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> in displays, we're doing, we're doing the same with quarantining. If it comes in on a Monday, it's coming off Thursday and getting checked in. We are only quarantining patron returns. So uh, we are not quarantining rails delivery. We are consider 
So everyone's sending to Rails is quarantining for three days. Rails is handling it, wearing masks and PPE. So we're considering them neutral in the transactions. So when we receive Rails bins, we are unpacking them immediately without quarantine. Because mm -hmm. you know, we, we also consider ourselves neutral because we are also wearing masks when we're handling things. So um, anyone who's wearing a mask, we're considering it a neutral party in the transactions and we are only quarantining things that come from patrons homes or staff. We are also having all staff, you know, put their stuff in the book drops as well. So they make sure and go through the quarantine process. In McHenry, we're doing the same thing. We're not quarantining what's coming in from rails and what comes in on Monday gets checked in on Thursday. Yeah, well, we're actually right now, we're still quarantining for like seven days, um, just <laughs> because that's how we kind of had it set up. But um, obviously, I'm listening to what everybody else is doing here, probably follow the same. And then with the rail stuff, yeah, we aren't quarantining at all. At, like Lori said, um, we're assuming that they've already been quarantined and no one's touching them. Well, you know, inappropriately or whatever. So we just unpack and check in. Um, and it sounds like Lincolnwood is kind of doing the same thing. They're only quarantining items returned by patrons. There's really not much that's coming through the blue bin. So we are quarantining that for extra times, but only for the three days doing that one, two, three, then the next day they get checked then. Mm -hmm. So that's what Highland Park is doing. If we got more stuff, I would probably, I don't know, making people wait just seems mean. I don't know what we would do. If everybody else is checking them in, we'll check them in. We'll jump off that Empire State Building with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so a quick clarification. Um, from me. So when you are receiving the rail spins, if items, you're not quarantining those, so if they are to be trapped for patrons and put on your hold shelf, you're just immediately checking them in and putting them on the hold shelf for the patron. Yeah. I'm seeing nods. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a question about what we're doing with stacks. And mm -hmm. that's, a, we're still thinking about that because we still don't have the public browsing in the library yet. I'm not sure if any folks do yet, but um, so that's something we're discussing now. And it just seems like from the studies we're seeing and everything else that getting, if you wash your hands frequently, um, if, if, people handling it within the library. Even patrons are supposed to be wearing masks in the library um, when they do come in to browse eventually. For us, it'll be um, not next week, but the following week. So we're also considering them neutral because we're all supposed to be doing, you know, wearing the masks. And so if we had to clean or quarantine every material that patrons touch while browsing in the library. First of all, that's only if they ended up putting it on a cart and not putting yeah. it back on the shelf. I mean, right. there's just really no way to do that. That, you know, makes, that makes sense to us. We're struggling with this too, but we are, because patrons are going to have to wear masks in the library too, we're going to consider everything they touch is neutral and it will be reshelved or they will reshelve themselves. Um, otherwise, I just, we're just, we, we can't figure out a way to do it that um, is consistent. Yeah, we are letting people, we're open and people are browsing in here. Okay. Um, and, you know, if, like you said, if they actually put it in the bin, where it says, if you've touched this, put it in the bin, we just let it quarantine for like the day. That like the next day is when staff would put it back on the shelf. And again, like you said, everybody, we are requiring 
you know, asking everybody to wear a mask and everybody has been so far wearing a mask. We haven't had a problem. We also have masks available for like, we had some kids that did not have a mask and we actually gave them a mask to come into the library. Um, so yeah, kind of like you were assuming that they're clean. Like you said, you can't tell, like, if, if you do have your stacks open, you don't know who touched something. Um, so I feel like it's also like a grocery store atmosphere since grocery stores are already open and they're t people are touching multiple things as it is. You just have to take it in good faith, you know? Yeah. yeah. Same, same, with like, same with Lake Villa. Yeah. We're the same and it's kind of that personal responsibility on the patron a little bit mm -hmm. they're yep. all wearing masks and washing their hands yeah you know and we also demanded. put the sign up there you know yeah you know to like are you healthy wear your mask mm -hmm. make your stay short and sweet and most people are i we don't really have not had people lingering in the library mainly they're just very happy to be able to come into the library and get materials um and you know we haven't had any issues with anybody so I do have to tell you last night, we opened up a couple tables with one chair for people if they bring in their laptops. Mm -hmm. I did have to tell a young man to put his mask back on, take his hamburger outside uh. and eat it in the rain. I was just like, oh. Oh. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're back. Um, so just kind of checking in on comments here in the chat, um, it looks like a lot of libraries are kind of following the same model where they'll count out um, kind of 40 on that, that fourth day after the return, then they'll um, check the item in. Um, uh, some libraries are agreeing that they're not quarantining um, incoming rails bins or items touched by patrons. Um, it sounds like uh, Crystal Lake is quarantining materials returned by patrons. Um, not quarantining the blue bins that arrive from rails. Um, Laura, what was that term you used? A new neutral? Neutral? I kinda yeah, it's a, it, it's a neutral party in the transaction. So, and it's people in their homes who aren't wearing masks when they're handling the materials, but everyone else you know, if they quarantine at the library when they come back from patrons, everyone else is it to me isn't to us is a neutral party. So that's how we've looked at it. That's been insight. Deborah, um, do you have any further questions that you want to elaborate on? Let me unmute myself. I don't think so. Um, we just had a request from governing board to talk to the group to gather and, and publish some best practices. Um, so I think we have what we need from everyone. It sounds like we're being relatively consistent across the membership um, when it comes to when we are or aren't quarantining materials. So I think, I think what we have what we need. Thank, well, thank you all for um, contributing. Um, if there's anything that you do want to add in, um, go ahead and pop it into the group chat, or you can obviously email one of us post-meeting, um, and we will work it into um, our write-up for governing board. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Now, should we go to the circulation manual? Yes, let's do okay. that. <laughs> Uh, so before I reshare my screen for the document, um, just kind of a background, um, if there's any if newcomers to the Cirque Tech group, um, over the past, gosh, I think it's about a year and a half or so, uh, the Circulation and Interlibrary Loan Advisory Group has been reviewing a revised draft of the CCS Circulation Manual, and we have been bringing um, uh, revised sections kind of piecemeal to the technical group for uh, full group review and approval. So at the March advisory group meeting, which feels like eons ago at this point, <laughs> uh, we checked, we reviewed the last two sections, uh, which covered holds and notices. Um, and we uh, sent the revised two sections out to the group for you all to take a look at um, and review, see if there was anything that needs to be clarified, anything you'd like to have added. 
let me share my screen at this time so I can bring up the document. Um, just in case there is something. Here we go. Minutes. Here we go. So um, this is section six and section seven. Um, the fun thing is, is that we already have something in section six that needs to be revised nice. based yep. on, yep, <laughs> based on 6.5 updates. So right away in um, part one under canceling holds, uh, we will be removing this bit about um, how staff do not have the option to cancel in transit holds because in a couple weeks, everyone will have that option to cancel in transit holds. Um, besides that, um, I'm going to open up to the group right now and see if anyone has comments or suggestions to the drafted sections. I am guessing. I'll give it another second or two. <laughs> Um, but if there, I don't think I see anything in the chat either. So if, if there's no su comments or suggestions, um, I guess we can go ahead and move to approve. So now it got really dark in my office. <laughs> <laughs> there's a big cloud outside. Um, so do you, how do we do this since you're going to change it? Anyway, you know. Uh, that is, um, could we make, would everyone be okay if we made the motion to approve the sections with the adjustment to 6.1? Would that be okay with everyone? So should I make a mo? can I make a motion to approve all the sections six, Section six and seven of the circulation manual with the exception of 6.1. Oh, Connie from oh. Ellen is saying she can only see okay. part of the screen. I, I will, let me, let me scroll through the documents. Yeah, and I would say, um, of course, some of, for example, pick up location with pick up anywhere is temporarily suspended. I, did, yeah. I so that just, um, I think we can still approve as written, just knowing that this is a very unusual time and governing board has sort of overwritten some of our normal CCS policies. Um, and if anyone is interested in um, referring to this before it is formally published on the, um, the learning portal, uh, I emailed it out to the CERC listserv, um, I believe on Monday, all the days roll together <laughs> right now. Um, so, you know, this will be posted up onto the learning portal. Um, in the meantime, if there's anything in here you want to refer to immediately, hopefully it should be in your email. If not, I can email it back out. And then, of course, with the overdue notice, we're anticipating at some point we'll go back to the standard three-day period instead of the current extended period for the first overdue notices, which we will talk about in a moment. Um, and then some parts of this, like the generating print notices, is um, just kind of a summary of um, procedures that are posted up to the learning portal. Um, so it's like the generating print notices and the notice maintenance section um, are both available 
on the learning portal as separate articles at this point. Okay, I believe we are at the, hopefully I scrolled sh uh, slowly enough for everyone to take a look. Let me kind of go back up here to the top. If there was anything else you wanted to see. Um, so we'll, I guess we'll put it out again if there are any um, questions or comments. Um, otherwise, I will turn it over to Anne for the motion. Okay, so can we have a motion to approve the circulation manual, sections six and seven, with the exception of the change that will be made to 6.1? I'll make, make the motion. It. And I second it. Is <laughs> there? Is that right? Thank you. Who made, the motion? Who, who made the motion initially? I did. Lisa. Lisa, Lisa McHenry. Okay. Karen. Yep. Thank you. Ooh, that was my first motion. Kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> my first motion, this my first calling, whatever it is. So this is going to be where usually when we're in the wider group, we'll go like all of, you know, all in oh. favor, all opposed. Um, but obviously, you know, I don't know how well that will work in a virtual setting because so, so many people have themselves muted. Um, I suppose we can see if anyone is opposed maybe. <laughs> we, we did roll call votes um, since it was a recorded. So um, at Evanston for all of our meetings, We've done roll call votes because of the fact that it's virtual. So I don't know if that's something we want to do or just do a nay or yay for either. Yeah, for, I think for something like this, I'd be more okay doing a yay or a nay. Um, we'll definitely be doing roll calls for um, votes that are really reliant on like one vote per library. If we need a majority library vote. Um, I think if we just do a quick yay or nay in the chat right now, that would give us a good sense of is anyone horribly opposed to these practices or do we all feel like we're on the same page? I don't think this is going to be a controversial one, I, is, but maybe is, it would be very dramatic if it was. <laughs> this is probably a very good thing to start off with to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> We could all use a little more drama in 2020 if anyone wants to like <laughs> vehemently oppose this <laughs> approval. It'd be exciting. <laughs> okay, so there's a whole bunch of yays. Any, op any opposed? So I guess the motion, motion, the motion, it's passed. Is that a motion? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so Greek to me. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, yeah, this is, I, I will say like round of applause to Anne right now. This is a uh, first virtual technical group that CCS is hosting. So it's, uh, she's pioneering <laughs> this whole thing. <laughs> yes, this is our first official technical or advisory group since Friday, March 13th, at which point we had the CERC advisory group and we're all like, we'll see you in a couple weeks. So you're a champion, Anne. We appreciate oh, this. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your patience. Um, okay, so moving on to the election of officers. Who wants to join me in this one? Come on. So, <laughs> so let me, uh, just to entice everyone, uh, let me just kind of go over the officer responsibilities and um, I'll review the nominations we've received so far. Um, so, uh, we've got two officers that we need to elect in. Uh, one is the vice chair and chair elect. Um, so they will serve as vice chairs this year and serve as chair the following year. Um, as vice chair, your responsibilities are to fill in for the chair in the event of an absence um, and to review the uh, minute drafts uh, with the secretary and, uh, and the chair um, before they're sent out to the group. Um, in the virtual setting, we're also hoping that the vice chair will help CCS uh, and uh, the chair monitor the chat as well, just so we don't miss any questions or comments. Um, so I, we did receive a nomination. Um, 
I think Karen Key is here. Uh, Karen from uh, Glenview uh, very graciously volunteered to serve. Um, I do have to ask if there are any additional nominations. If not, it's too easy. <laughs> <laughs> if not, um, I will pass this back to Anne for, I guess we'll do another motion. Ooh. So may I have a, may I please have a motion to approve, is it, would it be approve, elect? Motion invite to Karen to be the vice chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, move at Evanston. Kim moves at Evanston for Karen. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kim. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Enjoy. Lori seconds and displays. Okay, Yay, Lori. Awesome. Karen. <laughs> all in, now, do we all in favor? Any opposed to this? Two? All in favor? You can all nod your heads. I see thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, Karen, thank you. Yay. Thank you, Karen. Ooh. You're welcome. <laughs> I <Yay>. think. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the second position that is currently open is the secretary. Um, so obviously your primary responsibility is to take and distribute the meeting minutes. Um, so this entails taking minutes at the taking notes at the meeting, um, typing them up and sending them out to the group. Um, we, uh, Rebecca put together a template to use for the minutes so you won't be like completely flying blind here and creating from scratch. Um, typically you'd also be responsible for the, uh, the sign-in sheet. Obviously in a virtual setting, uh, we don't have the sign-in sheet so you'll be referencing the chat log um, to pull together the attendance. Um, and again, this year, the position is going to be a little different because since we are recording the minute or re we're recording the meeting, so you actually have something to refer back to if you did want to, you know, if you said, oh gosh, my notes are legible, who said this, we've got the recording. So um, this might be the year to volunteer <laughs> secretary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did not receive any nominations for this position. Um, so I'm going to open up the group and see if there's anyone who would like to self-nominate at this time. Come on, you know you want to do it. <laughs> Look good on your, you know, evaluation, self-evaluation. Do you have to do one of those at your library like I do? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, so many crickets. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to, I can give people a little bit of time to think about this. Um, and I'll probably pester the group via email uh, in another week or two to see if anyone has decide to change their mind and, and become uh, the secretary for this fiscal year. So for now, we'll leave it open. Think about it, think about it, uh, and we'll, we'll revisit. There's only three more meetings after this one. So we believe in you guys. We know there's a secretary out there for this group. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on that note, I, I am just going to take a quick, uh, a quick roll call break. Um, so for those who came in late at the beginning of the meeting, since we are in a virtual setting and we don't have a physical sign in sheet, um, we are just asking any attendees to send a chat with their name and library's three letter code, and that will stand in as attendance. So um, if you came in late and you did not already write your name and your three letter code into the chat box, please do so now. Go ahead, Ann, we'll move okay. on to the... So the next uh, item for discussion is the first overdue notice. The notices are currently sent or issued at 10 days past due and CCS would like feedback from the group that time frame is still appropriate or if it should be reduced. 
Yes. Um, so CCS libraries are, as you all know, are, are, have been following Rails recommendation for the amount of time to quarantine returned items. Um, that recommendation was previously set, previously set to seven days. Um, so at that time, that first overdue notice was adjusted to a period of uh, 10 days. Um, Pre-COVID, oh, first overdue notices went out three days past due. They were adjusted to be sent out at 10 days past due to account for the quarantine period. Um, based on round one of that Realm project, um, Rails reduced their quarantine period recommendation to three days. Uh, at this time, our first overdue notice schedule has not been reduced though. Um, so CCS was discussing potential options for how to schedule the first overdue notice. Uh, we wanted to get input from libraries on what would be the most effective schedule for you. So the options we have been kind of going back and forth with are leaving the first overdue notice at 10 days past due or reducing it down to seven days past due. Um, so some factors in this were how, you know, how your library patterned out that three-day quarantine schedule, which we discussed just a few minutes ago. Um, and another factor we thought that might impact this was how backed up libraries are in terms of returned items. And, um, you know, if you're, um, if you're a little behind on, on checking things in. Um, so we wanted to get input from the group at what first overdue notice model you'd prefer, if it would make more sense to have it reduced down to seven days, or if it would make more sense to continue to keep it at 10 days. I vote seven days at Glenview. I agree, at this point. Yeah. I would agree also, Prospect Heights. I'm going to say 10 days for Evanston. I'm going to say 10 days for McHenry. I'm going to say 10 days for Zion. I'm going to say 10 days for Gridge. And I've got the, I see some chats coming in. Um, a vote for 10 days, a couple suggestions for seven days. Do you think it would be possible to see after the first pick list comes through to see what that would look like? So on July 23rd, we could actually then gauge how much more we're going, work we're going to be doing if not all libraries are going to be participating in IntraCCS. So my fear is we're not participating, but another library might now pick up more holds. So I don't know what that's going to look like for some libraries in their ability to process quickly. Yeah, I would say, so this is something we do want to move forward together on, um, or we have to move forward together on. So what I'm hearing is that we're a bit split on this issue. We have some libraries who are ready to reduce down to seven, but a fair number based on my notes who, who aren't ready to have that reduced down to seven just yet. So my recommendation would be to keep it at 10 for now and then to revisit that this in another couple months. Um, for libraries who are interested in going back down to seven, do you see any potential issues with leaving it at 10? Besides that, of course, patrons won't be notified as quickly that items are overdue. I know so many of you are now fine free. I think we're up to 21 or 20 CCS libraries that are fine free. So I know, you know, necessarily patrons aren't getting 
overdue fees if they don't bring things back on time. Okay, I see lots of comments that like, we could live with it, we can keep going with 10 yeah. for now. Yeah. So, so the first overdue go notice would go out at 10 days and then the second one goes out at 15, five days later? Correct. Okay. So Wait, I, I have a question though about that, Deborah. So we're fine free now as well. And my concern, I was saying, telling Miko today that, so we still have about 2,800 items that were due on July 1st that haven't been returned. So it, that 14 day billing, or not billing, 14 day block. block mm -hmm. So that will go on their account af just after their 10 day overdue notice, right? That's correct. So for libraries that are fine free, currently all fine free libraries block their patrons if they have an item that is either 14 days overdue or 15 or more days overdue. So everyone has that long overdue block in place. So you're correct. And that's something to think about that if, again, we keep this overdue notice at 10 days, patrons then only have four or five days to bring their items back to avoid being blocked due to those long overdue materials. And then there's the quarantine piece in there too. So, mm -hmm. um, Mieko, I we could potentially look for our fine free libraries at increasing your long overdue block threshold. I believe there's at least one or two fine free libraries who have removed that um, temporarily. So that's something that I think that we would be comfortable working with you to increase the threshold of that long overdue block to be, you know, three weeks or whatever you would prefer. If, if you're finding that it is an issue for your patrons and they're, they're being blocked. Okay, thank you. That's, that's a setting that we've, we've standardized across CCS because it's worked really well, but we don't have anything officially written that your long overdue block has to be at 15 days or 14 days. So we can flex that upward if needed. Okay. Nico, do you have anything to add? I would say then we'll keep the, the first overdue notice at 10 days. Yeah. And then we will revisit this in another couple months when we, I think King brings up a good point that we're not quite sure what our workloads are going to look like once we resume interest CCS lending. And then once we add both Palatine and Grays Lake. So waiting until we have some information to go on when we see those changes in workflow and pick lists and hold settings um, might be the best bet for everyone right now. Okay, so no changes will be made at this time. We'll keep the first overdue at 10 days and we'll revisit this um, at a future date. Thank you all so much. I appreciate everyone's flexibility during this. Um, it, I think, really means a lot to your colleagues at other libraries that everyone has been so helpful and so accommodating and flexible with settings. Those are the best libraries ever. That's okay, recorded so for the record. <laughs> <laughs> the next item for discussion, for, uh, Michelle, it explains, would like to talk about when we can start doing ILL, non intra CCS again. Are libraries doing their own thing or are we waiting for the governing board to decide? Michelle, you want to speak to that? That's my question. <laughs> I'm um, basically my ILL staff um, is saying that when they go into a request, you can't always tell if libraries are sharing or not. Um, some appear to be sharing, but then if you go further in, I was just wondering what everyone else was doing. I, I don't know if like where this piece is um, and was just curious what other folks were experiencing. At Glenview, we are um, doing interlibrary loans. Uh, we send all of our stuff out. If anybody wants it, we'll mail it to them. Um, and we are actually allowed to borrow things. But for those items, we have to call those libraries that we see have it and ask if they're open to borrowing it. And then, then we know we can fulfill it. It takes a little more time, but um, it's working actually pretty well at the moment. Thank you. That's helpful to know. Is anyone else doing ILLs? Yay, Glenview. Okay. So, and 
it, okay, so. Um, well, isn't this, this isn't something that has to be decided by a governing board. Isn't this library by library type of, yeah. So we actually have just started to, again to start doing the um, OCLC ILL stuff. And are you doing something similar where if it's something that you want to borrow, you're calling them? Um, I, that, like I said, we just started it. So, you know what, we actually have not had any requests from our patrons. We're just kind of right now filling. Um, and right now we haven't okay. had any requests. We're not, my, <laughs> nothing um, like Glenview. <laughs> yeah, no, what my staff said, um, while we were all closed, they were logging into the system and saving all the requests, um, that were coming in and printing them because you know they only stay in there first so so we have like this large backlog i don't even know if oh my heavens I, yeah they were trying to be you know oh we don't want to miss anybody kind of thing but now it's been so long mm -hmm. that's one piece of it but um we do yeah. have a lot of requests yeah, you probably will maybe want to contact your patrons to see right. if they still want those requests. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, okay. Thank you for your input, guys. And there is a comment from Zion in the chat. Um, Kelly says that at Zion, they're attempting to fill requests that they receive from other libraries and they're contacting other libraries as well when they get requests and they've been able Great. to fill most of them. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, the last item for new business. So when reopening, how will you monitor patrons as to browsing, handling books, and replacing them on the shelf? The question of open or closed stacks has also come, to, come up. So we sort of already talked about this. Um, does anybody have anything they would like to add to what we talked about earlier? We're at Prospect Heights, we're also kind of looking at it as, as like the grocery store. You know, you kind of take your chances. Take them off and down. You can't monitor them constantly. So um, and hopefully the patrons are neutral, as someone said. And the other thing is that I also feel like patrons who are coming back in the library are comfortable with a little more risk maybe than those who aren't returning. So I think they're already in a mindset that, you know, this is fine. So I, I'm also kind of thinking that our patrons who are coming back and who are browsing are fine with some, you know, additional level of, of risk. So. Mm -hmm. I, that also kind of factors into what we're doing, which is open stacks and um, not really doing anything but reshelving materials when they're removed from the shelf. Um, Kelly from Zion um, mentions that Zion stacks are closed. Um, and so they're doing limited lobby services only, uh, grab and go back to books already checked out, faxing, copying, card renewals, um, and new cards, uh, hold requests and reference questions. Um, and they're also still offering curbside service for those that don't want to come in. So at Prospect Heights, we have not opened to the public yet, but we will be doing so on Monday. Up until now, we've been doing curbside, which has been great. Our patrons love it. Um, on Monday, we've taken out furniture and all that. Um, our youth department will be closed to the public, but we'll be pulling, you know, items from them. But they will be able to access the uh, stacks and adult services. And we're just, we just have not made things very comfortable for people. So we're hoping that they will just kind of come in and go out quickly. I think that's a really good point. I mean, you know, we we have been for years like the comfy library come in sit down read it browse and now we have taken away anything that anybody might perceive as a seat you know <laughs> display cubes or you know i was either even looking at like the kick step stools and the stacks i'm like oh no oh no you're not sitting on that but you know there's some things we have to leave out there for people who can't bend over to the lower the lowest ranges of the large print, like like me, I can't do that. So, 
Oh, and I forgot to say, we are allowing patrons computer access for an hour a day. Yeah, but they, they yeah, spread out the computers and so there's fewer computers. We're doing appointments right now. And mm -hmm. then I think within a couple of weeks, we will, we will just say, yes, if there's a computer available and they're only a quarter of what is available and you can only sit for an hour, I think that's coming. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of along that line about um, the time limits, uh, Belinda from Algonquin asks, do libraries limit time for patrons in the library? Um, at Glenview, we have a uh, one hour appointment times for mm -hmm. anybody coming in for any reason. So mm -hmm. How, Lake Villa, uh, we, haven't, we haven't set time limits at Lake Villa except for computer usage of two hours. Um, but we're finding that patrons are not hanging out. I mean, I think they're really taking it upon themselves to come in, get their stuff and leave. Um, and we've opened up everything, even the children's department, parents, there's yeah. very few parents who are even coming in with their children. So um, it wasn't quite what I expected it was going to be. You know, you kind of thought, oh, everyone's gonna rush back. They're not rushing back. This is our second week of being open and um, it's been relatively quiet. Yeah, same here at Fremont, because yeah, we have our children's department is still open. They have taken like all the tech play things out of there, you know, but the books are, they can still come in and browse the, you know, the book area, but no one really has lingered. I mean, even on the computers, I don't know if we set a time limit up there or not, but really, no, I've not seen anybody staying like, you know, we used to have someone that stayed the whole day you know, from nine in the morning till nine at night, you know, that kind of thing has definitely not been happening. Great, thank you. Yeah, for libraries who are enforcing time limits in the building, how, how are you going about doing that? I'm curious um, if you have appointments, for example, for an hour, how are you ensuring that patrons don't stay beyond that? Um, at Glenview, we have, um, when they come in and they check in, uh, there's a uh, stickers that are on the table for the top of the hour. So like the pile of 10 o'clocks and 11 o'clocks and 12 o'clocks on and on. And they'll take one and stick it on themselves. And that's, so if they show up at nine o'clock, they're gonna take a sticker that says 10 on it, the number 10, so that they know that at the 10 o'clock top of the hour, they need to go. So we have the rest, the next 50 people can come in. Um, and then we have an announcement at 10 till the hour to say, you know, it's 10 till now, please be aware and thank you for visiting today. And, um, and it's working out pretty well. It's not as busy, it was initially, you know, we're on our second week as well. And um, it's kind of, uh, I would say uh, even, you know, every day is kind of an even keel. It's not like a big spike and then it drops off. It's kind of just steady as she goes. Well, do you actually have like 50 people each hour then coming in? Uh, we don't have them making the appointment, but then what happens is people are walking up. And so we're kind of modifying as you go, you know, you're learning the process, what works best. So um, if people walk up um, and, and once people are in from their appointments that though for that hour, anybody walks up, we go ahead and let them in. Then we log them in, they get a sticker and they go on in. So we are filling close to uh, the 50, not every hour though, but most of the time. Okay. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. Have you had to kick anybody out? <laughs> um, well, there's been a few people that didn't want to follow. Uh, and I understand because we're all, there's levels of frustration in everybody for what we're all enduring in our lives. And um, we don't really want them to come in the building with any material um, because we want it still returned to the curbside book drop for quarantining purposes. And none of that comes in our building anyway. That's why it goes into pods at the back of the building. So we didn't want material brought in, but some people get, well, a couple of people got really feisty about it. Um, and we're saying, I'm a taxpayer and I can do what I want basically. And, you know, I can come in this building anytime I want since it's open oh. and yada, yada, yada. And <laughs> so we just looked at the person and let them finish their adult temper tantrum. And then we're like, all right, here, give me your stuff, you know. So only a couple people. Most people are very happy, pleasant, cooperative, you know, uh, showing a lot of appreciation, you know, for all the staff and everything we're doing to try to uh, provide services in any way we can to all of them. So it's been a good experience so far. 
So. Great. Um, I just want to read out, um, Kelly uh, says that Zion patrons are allowed to utilize limited computer labs for an hour a day in there, um, allowing seven patrons in a computer lab at a time. Um, they've removed all the furniture from their lobby. Um, and that's the only area the patrons can be in at this time. Um, patrons are asked what they want to do with the library when they enter by security, and then they're um, guided or ushered through their service. It's kind of like a concierge. You've got library concierges. Actually, that's the term we've been using in our meetings. And we're like, oh my God, they might, they might like this too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fun. Um, and then a question from uh, Jeff at Morton Grove. Um, how are libraries going to handle card registrations in person once patrons are allowed in the building? Um, if you use paper registrations, are you going to continue using them or modify this? We, we do use paper registrations. Oh, as, along with um, online registration. We're, we're gonna continue, but we have all the plexiglass and everything set up. We don't get so many that it's, I'm not too concerned about it. At Zion, we decided that the risk of them writing everything down on the piece of paper versus conversing with us, um, the risk was much lower, um, you know, contaminating the air with, with our, uh, whatever comes out of our mouth. So um, we are gonna still do the paper registrations and it's actually very helpful when you have a mask on and one of the visors and the acrylic is up for them to write it down so that you're not saying, what, what did you say? Repeat that. Um, so that's been helpful. Yeah, we still use the paper um, applications. We actually have give, they give us their license and we take all the information from their license and write it down. Um, we have been, um, we have a, a basket that we put the pens in after they've used use them and we can have our you know shelvers which are runners right now and stuff um sanitizing those things afterwards to put yeah. back in we actually just put our pens and pencils in quarantine and then take them out um on we've been quarantining them for seven days since it's wood and we don't know how long it stays on the items um so we just put a ziplock in quarantine each day Um, I've got a, a question from Cindy at Niles. Um, if libraries are accepting returns at their CERC desk? No. No. Zion no. is not. We have a, um, the garage drops, but we also did put a large bin in the lobby when they're first walking in that they can put the stuff there because otherwise they're just going to want to bring it to the desk. Yeah, we also have um, like outside a couple of boxes on a cart that they can, because we have been putting our quarantine things like in one of those totes, cardboard totes, and then just taking it upstairs in a cardboard tote. So we have those totes outside the front doors that, you know, if they do come in with their stuff, we just direct them back outside to put the stuff in the tote. And of course the outside drops are open if they want to drive through the, you know, drive through drops. Our security staff, one of the first questions they ask when the patron approaches the building is, do you have returns? Because the return is right next to them at that point. Um, so we can avoid the uh, drops at the circulation desk at Zion. Man, Kelly, Zion, you guys are going to have to keep that concierge model. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kelly, you're going to have to keep that concierge model going. Oh, God, they're going to get you to it. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, yeah, thanks, everyone, for um, that information. With cocktail service. <laughs> I'd be on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, are there any any other questions? <laughs> any other questions related um, besides your drink order uh, before we wrap this conversation up? I'll turn it back to you, Anne. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. This was, it was great seeing you and talking with you all. And our next meeting is October 9th, right back here on Zoom 
and I hope somebody, you know, one of you will think about being secretary because really it's all recorded. So it's going to be super easy. And I, I make a motion. Oh, oh, go, ahead, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was going to make a motion to, to I was going to make a motion to uh, can, uh, close out the meeting. This is right, Kim from because, Evanston. Right, because you're sitting outside, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> My Al, Alex is cleaning right now and he's got the vacuum going and I just can't handle the noise anymore. So I had to, I got pushed out onto the balcony. So yes, these are my flowers. Lovely. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So yes, I'm stuck outside for about an hour. Oh, well, I wouldn't call it stuck. <laughs> I'm stuck in this office. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. Okay. So we'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 1051. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Like I'm yeah. Oh. oh my gosh. Doing great. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So, do we have a second? Sorry, Anne. Do we oh, I second that. it. <laughs> Who put me in charge here? <laughs> I did when I left. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Okay. So go go ahead and adjourn formally. Okay. I will stop the recording. I formally adjourn the meeting at ten. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now.